grace, mercy, and peace to you, God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Five words. Perhaps you heard them as a child when you were trying to study in school. Perhaps you heard them at a different time in your life. I know that one time when I thought about writing a devotion or a book, the five W's came to mind. Who, what, why, where, and what's happening in your life at that time? Who, what, why, where? Well, I think when is very important. That's one of those questions in the scripture say, Jesus said, when you pray, not if, but when you pray, say, Father. Well, when could take on a different tone if you're involved in two wins on the same day within 10 minutes apart. That happened to me yesterday. Came down to teach confirmation with Vicar yesterday, and usually I get off the highway, oh, I like to see the hills on the way to St. Genevieve, and I'm driving along, and I think I'm doing 57 mile an hour, sorry. Wood. Okay, see Genevieve. And uh, driving along the left hand side of the road, there is a police car behind another car. I looked at my speedometer and I think I was going faster than the speed limit. My first thought was, well, I was going downhill. I mean, doesn't that make a difference? So I kept looking in my rearview mirror, very conscious of the road ahead of me, and I see the police car turn around. And it starts following the car behind me. And I said, I'm going to watch, see what happens. So I turn left to come to church, and the police car turns left. And now there's only one car behind me, and that's the police car. That's when the second wind became much more important. It was when the police car stopped and turned around. Praise God. <laughs> no ticket. You see, wind can be a very important aspect of what's taking place in your life. You've probably heard these before. When all else fails, start over again. Right? When all else fails, for some of us, it's read the instruction book. When all else fails, you're at the age that I am, you put the GPS away and somebody hands you a map. They're still good, by the way, most of the time. And you can get more detail. When you pray, it's not if, it's when. Jesus gave us some really good advice about prayer. There's a sermon outlined there for you. There's some blanks to fill in. I encourage you to do that. When you pray, form a habit like Jesus did. Jesus was in the habit of prayer. Do you know next to money and things, mammon, those things that get us in trouble because of our relationship with God and the things around us, next to that comes prayer. So Jesus really gives us advice about what it means to pray. Jesus formed a habit. It started at his baptism. Jesus was in prayer, and God the Father sent the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. And he said, this is my son. Listen to him. When Jesus was transfigured, where was he when that took place? Remember the transfiguration? Jesus' clothes became a dazzling light, but what happened right before that? Jesus went up on a mountain with Peter, James, and John to pray. Every time there was an important decision, even small decision to be made, Jesus was found in prayer. After a busy day, that's the Matthew 14 passage, after feeding 5,000, after healing their sick, he went to a desolate place by himself to pray. It was his head. Before he sent his disciples out, after his resurrection, he prayed. He told them that he was going to send them out as wolves, as sheep. And they were sent out because he prayed for them. He said, whoever sins for you are forgiven, they will be forgiven. Whoever sins you don't forgive, they won't be forgiven. But he prayed before he sent them out. Perhaps that says something about us and our praying for big decisions. Any decision in your life where you need to pray about it beforehand? If it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. No matter what it is. In our families, for our church, for our nation. I pray for our nation. I pray for it every day. I pray against the Prince of Darkness and ISIS and all of those places where Christians are being killed. I pray for our election. They do not pray for candidates anymore. None of them. I pray that the Lord is still in charge. Certainly go out and vote. Pray before you vote. I don't care what political party you're in. I don't really care. I do care that you know the Lord is in charge. Matter of fact, 
maybe you're part of the Christian party. Not political, but people gather together who believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior and Lord, who reigns now and will reign eternally. Doesn't that kind of ease the tension and pressure? Pray before you vote. When you pray, secondly, find a private place. Jesus speaking in Matthew 6 is where you find the other aspect of the Lord's Prayer. When you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. We teach our children when they're very young, it's a good thing to fold your hands and close your eyes. Why? Because when you open your eyes, you're distracted almost all the time, aren't you? And if your hands aren't folded, what are they doing? That doesn't mean you have to. It's not a law. I find out that when I go into private, when I pray, I'm much more concentrating on what I'm praying. Now, I will tell you, I do pray when I drive. But I pray with my eyes open when I do that. And I would encourage you to do the same. Jesus tells us to go into a room by ourselves, and there becomes a private conversation. You can talk to Jesus about anything in your life. There's nothing that's excluded. And the thoughts you have, the things that bother you, other people don't need to know about if you talk to him, unless it's dangerous for you or someone else. It's a private conversation. It's a private communion. It's a bonding between you and the Lord. One of the challenges I have in my life, and I am 71 years old, I've been praying for a long time, is that I sometimes don't listen enough. I learned not to start with my pity party, but start with praising God for who he is. Oh, I get to the pity party, don't worry about that. But I like to come to that last. It's also a private I and you. The Lord sees you. We believe the Lord is all knowing, all seeing. He has seen you every minute of your life. And He loves you so much that He offers baptism to give forgiveness of sins. Not something we do, it's something He's done. He offers us the Lord's Supper for forgiveness of sins often. All this from His gracious hand. When you pray, set no limits. Jesus speaking in Luke 11, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread. If you look at the both aspects of the Lord's Prayer, both here and Matthew, there are some differences. It's okay to pray the Lord's Prayer the way we do it. It's a combination of those two passages that we pray. It is a God-pleasing prayer. When we pray it, when we pray it, we can pray it together or we can pray it alone. The first two words of the Lord's Prayer, our Father. God is our Father again because of Jesus Christ. He hallowed His Father's name. He brought about God's will by dying on the cross for our sins. He never gave into temptation in order to be a perfect sacrifice. He interceded in the Garden of Gethsemane. One of the commentators, one of the professors of seminary said the great suffering he went through wasn't just a cross. The picture on the children's bull of the day is Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was a prayer that brought sweat like blood. He was in agony. Father, not my will, but your will be done. And yet when he taught the Lord's Prayer, he already included our Father, yours and mine, in that prayer. He brought God's forgiveness through his own death, even on the cross. Do you remember what he said? Father, forgive them. Well, they know not what they do. Our prayer is acceptable to God because we're praying in faith because we are those people who realize how sinful we are and how much we need the forgiveness He offers through Jesus Christ. And then Christ prays and says, when you pray, forgive others because you've been forgiven. When you pray, expect ordinary, extraordinary results in all situations. Jesus says, pray, give us each day our daily bread. I don't know if you know this or not, but at the time of Jesus, when they walked on the earth, they didn't really have forks, knives, and spoons for a lot of their meals. You know what they used for the utensil? Bread! You've done it, haven't you? Dipped it in the spaghetti sauce, make sure you got it all. That garlic is really good, by the way. But they used bread for the utensil. And then Jesus goes on to tell a story about the request for bread and what that story looks like. When Ruth and I were in Israel in 2011, we went to this place called Capernaum, and there there was a 
a, a model, not really a model, but rocks and stone where a house stood. And when the man went to ask for bread, he would have, his, the man of the house had to step over his kids who were sleeping in the next room, not really a room, but separate from them, climb over them to get the bread. He says, hey, I don't want to do that. I'll wake up the kids. You ever do that? I don't want to wake up the kids. You know what that's like in the middle of the night? But if the man continues to be persistent, because of his impudence, he will give him the bread. How persistent are you? In that gospel reading, in the Greek language, it says this. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking until there's an answer. Now, how do you know when you got an answer? Sometimes you don't. God knows. He's the one that needs to know. But I will tell you, when there is peace, there's nothing that's greater than that when you pray. Ask, seek, and knock. Today, prayer is the utensil. It is a tool that gives us, enables us to make it through. A minute, an hour, a day, a lifetime. Jesus says later on, each day has enough trouble of its own. This professor one day spoke about this. He said, take a glass of water. How much does it weigh? I don't know, a pound is 16 ounces, right? Something like that. And so a pint's a pound the world around. So a pint is eight ounces, it's a pint's a pound. So hold a glass of water for a minute. Is that hard? No. Hold a glass of water for an hour. Does it get more difficult? Hold a glass of water for a day. What's going to happen? The professor says, a minute, no problem. An hour, an ache, a day, an ambulance. What happens to us if we carry our burdens all the time? They get heavy. Jesus invites us to sign up front. Come to you all are worried, heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. My prayer is that we would echo the Lord's prayer when we pray. Regarding the habit of prayer, the privacy of prayer, and expecting extraordinary things. This room is going to end just a little bit differently today. I want you to be engaged in this room to understand where you come in. So I have three questions to ask you. Please raise your hand if you know the answer. The first one is, raise your hand if you believe there is someone else here today who has prayed for you. Raise your hand if you think someone else here has prayed for you. Okay, good. Put your hand down. Now, secondly, raise your hand if you have prayed for someone else who is here today. Yeah, many of us have, haven't they? Now, the third question. Is there anyone who has, been pray who has prayed for you all here today who isn't here today, literally, physically? Yes, Jesus Christ. John 17, I do not pray for these alone, I pray for all of them who will come to faith because of your message. Now you all can raise your hands. You've all been prayed for. Come on, get it up there. Bart, you can raise yours up too. Small church, we can use your first name. We've all been prayed for. And that's the reason we rejoice in this. Jesus starts this prayer, our Father. Praise God for that. I still remember the first funeral I ever did. When I graduated from seminary in 1985, the first funeral was for a 19-year-old who was addicted to alcohol and drugs. His aunt asked if I would do the funeral. He wasn't a member. And so I didn't know what I was going to say. And then I read his diary. The night before this young man, who was really sick because of his addiction and alcohol, wrote in his diary, I prayed to God for help. He would never have taken his life if he understood what was going on and that God was there for him completely. But he did pray, didn't he? And I pray the Lord answered his prayer in a way not expected by us. But I believe God took care of him. He knew how sick he was. You all have answers to prayer. I've seen them, many of them. And he will continue to answer prayer. I'd like to end this sermon in another unique way. I want you all to stand and together, let's pray the Lord's Prayer again. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, 
invite you to turn in your Jim's card if you have a special permit request. Please hold the card and give it to one of the ushers. 